says, choose a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. Well, yes, I think in 1970 I did have to learn to love the job first because it didn't come naturally right from the beginning. But uh, in 1970 I had applied to go to Shannon uh, College or Shannon Hotel School as it was then, Shannon College of Hotel Management and I know Philip Smith is with us here today. And uh, that time we were told that we had to work for six months in a hotel before we could even come as far as Shannon Airport. So I was fortunate enough to uh, be employed within what was then known as the Great Southern Hotel in Air Square in Galway, my home city. And uh, I had a very interesting few months there, but uh, it was the first time I walked into a kitchen dressed in chef's whites. I'd never been in a hotel kitchen in my life. In fairness, not even, we didn't even have induction in those days, our orientation as we call it now. And there's a very intimidating man, quite a tall, obviously turned out to be the head chef, said, oh, so you're the new boy, go down to the larder and get a hat, tray of half grapefruits now. And I said, my goodness, this fellow. I said, yeah, I said, I'll go down, but please, say please before I go. <laughs> well, my goodness. When he stopped bouncing off the ceiling and uh, I went, I got the grapefruit and he did not say please and he certainly did not say thank you. But he turned out to be a great teacher and a great man and uh, what a wonderful start to have in the hotel business at the Great Southern Hotel in Galway. So by May 1971, I turned up in, uh, in Shannon Airport, expecting then we would go straight into class and we would start having all the academics of how to be a great hotel manager and how to do things properly. And uh, yeah, this seemed quite, quite reasonable. But the first day we were there, we were told, right, you're working in the kitchen at the airport uh, restaurant for the next four months until September. So we started working in the kitchen. And part of this presentation today will be peppered with the odd story here and there, so indulge me a little bit in that. But uh, I was working with a gentleman from Clare called Pat Lucy, who's still in, uh, in and around Dennis. And we had to work from 6 a.m. Oh, it wasn't too bad until about 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon in the kitchen. Well, one night, Pat and myself, we'd been out all night, as you do at that stage in your life, and we actually hadn't got to bed, and we went straight to work, worse for wear. An order came in for Air Canada for 200 omelettes on one of their transatlantic flights. So the night chef immediately said, you get working, you guys, you make omelettes now and do nothing else till you have 200 omelettes. I said, wow, 200 omelettes. So we had two big mixing bowls, one for the shells, one for the eggs. And after a while I noticed I was putting the eggs in that bowl, which I think was the right bowl, and Pat was putting the shells in that bowl. And then I suddenly realised I was putting the shells, the eggs in the shell bowl, and he was putting the, the shells in the, or the eggs in the shell bowl. So we got totally mixed up, but it was too late. The mix was done. We started frying off the omelets. So we cooked them off, and this is my little cartoon of what it would have been like going across the Atlantic that morning on poor old Air Canada, uh, trying to eat very, very crunchy omelets. But you know, it was very interesting this morning to hear about this whole concept of self-belief. And I'm really delighted to see some of Shannon's students here in the audience as well today. Welcome, ladies. And, you know, to, to, to understand what Jorgen Blum, who was the first principal of the Shannon College of Hotel Management, the poor Swiss man coming over to Ireland in the 1950s at the invitation of Brendan O'Regan to try to train all these poor guys how to, how to be hoteliers, how to be hotel managers, was quite something. But Jorgen Blum instilled in us a huge sense of self-belief. We really did believe that this was one of the best hotel schools in the world and we could really do whatever we aspire to do in life. And I thank him so much for that because it really was something amazing. Especially, he said, you are the best hotel school in the world. And I said, well, okay, that's great. So, off we go to Geneva for our second year as uh, stagiaires with, uh, I was with Moven Pick in Geneva at the time. And I remember, again, working in the kitchen, believe it or not, and I still can't cook very well, but in the kitchen, I'm chopping away at the onions, and there's another uh, stagiaire beside me, and uh, he came from the Col Atelier Lausanne. And so he said, so which hotel school do you come from? And I said, well, I come from Shannon Hotel School. I said, Shannon? Never heard of that. That's the best hotel school in the world. He said, well, no, I'm sorry, I come from Lausanne, and I know that. Well, we had a very good course at the time, which I thought an awful lot of people now within the industry, within uh, third level education, really look at how uh, hotel schools ran their operations, how they put the whole curricula together, and to see how 
We have such a good mix of craft of trade and of academic teaching. And this is something that has stood, I think, to the, to the hotel business and to hoteliers throughout all of our careers, preparing us to be hotel managers, but also fully and really understanding our business. So for the final year, uh, we then spent in England after doing a financial administration course in Shannon for yet another year. And this is the QE2, uh, whose home base I'll explain to you in a second. When I came back from Switzerland, as was the fashion of the times, I had long hair and a moustache, and I was told to cut it and shave it, and I said no. And I held out for most of the year. And just coming up to the end of the year, uh, we had Mr. Blum who came into the class one day, and he said that tomorrow the people from Forte are coming to interview you for your year in England. And they have said quite clearly that you will have no long hair, no moustaches and lawless I will fix you good and proper in England. I said, Thank you very much, Mr. Blum. Anyway, I didn't call his bluff. I cut my hair, I shaved my moustache, but he did give us one form to fill out. And he said, please fill out this form, say where you would like to, what kind of a place you would like to go to in England. So I wanted a big hotel in a big city. So I said, I would like to go to a small hotel in the country, considering that I was going to be fixed good and proper. So there I got, Southampton post house, 200 rooms, right in the middle of a very nice city of uh, Southampton. But I'd always thought that, and NASA and myself were, were married at the time, and I'd always thought that really we need to travel abroad. We had gone at this stage from Southampton to Swindon to Glasgow. And finally, I really pestered my head office in London and said, please, please, let me go abroad. So they did say in the end, okay, you can go to Dubai, is that okay? And I said, yes, where exactly is it? But I, I would go anyway. And uh, of course, we arrived in August 1978 on the shores of Dubai, uh, literally a hot August night, at about maybe 45 degrees at that time of the night. But uh, what an adventure it was for us at the time. This was one of the photographs taken from the workman's lift of what became the World Trade Center uh, in Dubai. But a lot of people, thought that uh, Dubai really was nothing, there was only sand and it was only camels, but no, not quite. If you look at these photographs, for example, that was the Creekside in 1981 in Dubai, already quite a vibrant place. So by 1979, we were ready to open our hotel, which was the first management contract for 40 hotels in the Middle East, known as the Dubai International. And we had a big international buffet throughout the ground floor for the celebration in 1979 uh, for this particular event. But at that time, it was very easy to go outside Dubai, and I had gone to a small farm where this uh, local Arab man had, uh, had some camels. And I said, we're having international buffets, and one, of course, would be a, an Arabic buffet. Do you think we could have a camel just to go around the place to, to make it look nice? So believe it or not, he rode the camel down the airport road, and I rode the camel into the ballroom and sat it down behind the buffet. Well, it was a little bit smelly, but I, hey, it worked anyway. It was, a bit of, uh, <laughs> it, it was kind of fun. Then after a few years, in 1982, so we've been almost four years in Dubai, um, and this is something that has interested me a lot in the business. I think that in, uh, in previous decades and earlier years within the hotel industry, we were more willing, I felt, to give responsibility and authority to younger people. And sometimes it surprises me that uh, we, we, we're not always that keen, for example, to give graduates coming out from hotel school a lot more authority and responsibility when they actually come into the operations. And I think it's something we should consider. You know, why do you have somebody who's number three or number two in a restaurant? If that person has been trained so much, why wouldn't they be able to really uh, have a lot more authority? So I was 29 years of age, and uh, our area director came out from uh, London and uh, said, don't you think, Gerald, it's time you had your own hotel? And I said, you know, I want to be a general manager before I'm 30 years of age. So, yes, you're right. So he said, well, I've got the perfect place for you. It's called the Parkview Hotel in Durban in South Africa. So I went to my boss, who had actually lived in South Africa, and he said, Gerald, don't touch it. They're selling it. They haven't put a penny into it since the day they bought it, and they're getting out because of apartheid. Then I called my boss and I said, told him this, and he said, no, 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 he said, we are definitely not selling uh, the hotel. 
And I said, that's great, I went back to my hotel boss and I said, right, I'm going, I'm taking it. So Anasa, seven months pregnant, we went off from uh, Dubai to Galway, actually, we ended up for a week or two, and then off to South Africa, to Durban, to start the latest phase in our lives, about three weeks before my uh, 30th birthday, so we made that thing. And then our first son, Tom, was born a few weeks, actually, after we had arrived. But a few days after I arrived, I got a call to come to the lobby. And uh, these two gentlemen in the lobby said, uh, we'd like to see some rooms and to see around the hotel. And I said, oh, good. I said, are you looking to book a conference or a convention or something? They said, no, we're going to buy the hotel. I said, well, it's not for sale, my head office told me. And with that, he pulled a letter out of his pocket from Forte Property Department, authorising him to view the hotel with, uh, with the possibility of buying it. Well, as I say, we have ways of making things not work, you know, in the business. But uh, <laughs> after about six months of uh, negotiations, surprisingly, the whole deal fell apart. And NASA and I managed to stay in Durban for the next two and a half years. Then Forte took me back to uh, London. NASA, by the way, is a solicitor by profession and had worked in most of these places, including uh, Dubai, as, as a lawyer. Though, but as a female lawyer at that time, yeah, she had to have two signatures on any, on any deal because one signature for a female didn't work. <laughs> She's denying it now, but don't worry, ladies. Uh, we now have nine female ministers in the UAE government, and uh, Sheikh Mohammed is very enlightened when it comes to the role of Arab women within, within government. But anyway, back to the Ariel uh, Hotel in Heathrow, which some of you may recognise the, uh, what was called in, in some corny advertising at the time, the mint-shaped hotel, uh, sorry, the polo-shaped hotel has been refurbished to mint condition. So, sorry about that. But this was uh, Queen Elizabeth, actually. Any of you have been watching the series The Crown recently, which is an amazing series, uh, would say that she looks pretty like the actress uh, in, in that she opened the hotel in 1962. After 14 months in uh, London, again begging head office to send us back to, uh, to, to the Middle East, uh, I got the opportunity to come to what was in one of the leading hotels of the world, and that was back to Bahrain, uh, which again is a beautiful island, lovely place to work with just uh, incredible people. And uh, there's a gentleman in this audience, actually, not a million miles away, who eventually, some years later, was also a general manager of this great hotel, was uh, Paul Carty. But again, I think it's so important, and it was mentioned uh, earlier today as well, how we have to be mobile in our careers. We have to be mobile in our attitude towards letting young people go, letting young people develop, let them go to different parts of the world. And sometimes you might have a great assistant manager, you don't want her to go or him to go, but you know what, it makes a lot of sense to let them travel, let them even see other companies. I always believe, let them go and see other companies, who knows, they might come back to my company and they'll have learned a lot of other things by working for somebody else. So I think international mobility, which is very much uh, a feature of the, uh, of the hotel business, is something that is so important for us. And then, no, sorry, the diplomat in Bahrain, Nasser, you were told me, you were supposed to tell me to move on the slide, you didn't. But anyway, that's all right. So that was the diplomat hotel in Bahrain. And then, really good fortune, in uh, January 1988, NASA and myself, with now our adopted daughter Angelina, our son Tom, we actually got the opportunity to move back to Ireland. And there I was executive director of the Shelburne Hotel and also responsible for the four Irish hotels at the time, uh, which again, uh, Paul Carty was in charge of the, uh, the, the Dublin International Hotel. And uh, we had some great people working with us at the time, Morris Bergen for, from Actons, Louis Murphy from the D Dunraven Arms, as I'm sure many of you or all of you know, uh, John Hegarty, who's in the front office at the uh, Conrad Hotel uh, in Dublin, and uh, Brendan Curtis, uh, whom I met this morning as well. So we had a great team of people and looked after Actons and Kinsale, the old ground in it's the Conway in Belfast, and the Dublin Airport Hotel, as well as the beautiful Shelburne. At that time, we renovated all the front-facing rooms, and we also built the, uh, the new ballroom, which was a, a great opportunity for all of us. But, you know, there's something about us that NASA and myself, we always want to go back. We always want to live in the Middle East, because it's something that had just possessed us, and we just, contrary to so many impressions people have of the region, we really wanted to go back. 
but um, in particular I wanted to go back to Dubai. So eventually Dubai, uh, the Forte head office called me over uh, to London and we had this very nice uh, Italian boss, Alfonso Genuzzi. And Alfonso, I said to him, look, I want to go, I want to set up an office in Dubai, I want to develop the Forte brand throughout the Middle East, we only have three hotels there and we can have as many as we want if you just let me, please, please do this. So he said, we've considered this request and we can't justify it financially at this stage. But what we will do, he says, we'll give you responsibility for our eight Caribbean hotels and our three Middle East hotels. And when, when you have enough hotels, you can then move out to Dubai if you sign up more contracts. And I said, that's great, Alfonso. I said, what's the snag? And I don't know how well you know West London, but uh, Alfonso, where we had our head office, uh, in his best Italian accent says, you'll be based in Slough. And I said, well, well thank you very much, Alfonso. But again, we took it, we did it. And um, we then stayed in the UK and uh, really enjoyed it. What a learning experience to be able to travel throughout the Caribbean, right down to Guyana in uh, Northeast South America, and really understand another dimension of life, and at the same time keep an eye on trying to develop the Middle East and really trying to do what we knew would be, would be um, possible. This is the Sandy Lane, which was one of our hotels before it was bought over by some very renowned Irish people. Uh, that was back, this is the new Sandy Lane. The old Sandy Lane uh, had uh, a story or two less than, uh, than this particular hotel. But in December 91, finally Forte said to me, okay, we know now you've got more management contracts. Uh, we will now arrange for you to go to Dubai and set up the office that you've always wanted to do. I said, thank you so much. That's a great opportunity. And they, this was early December 91. When will you go? Sometime over the next six months? I said, no, I'm going to go before the end of the month. They said, why? And I said, because I know you guys. You'll change your minds again, won't you? So off we went on St. Stephen's Day uh, with our family. Now we had our youngest son, Michael, had been born in, in uh, Windsor in London. So our three children, one was born in South Africa, one was adopted from the Philippines, and one was born in Windsor. But they've all got Irish passports. In fact, our daughter, Angelina, she got her naturalization done while we were at the Shelburne Hotel. And I was telling some of our friends at, uh, at lunch today that her address on her naturalization papers was uh, Angelina Lawless, Shelburne Hotel, Dublin. So she's, uh, she's got a great address and something we will always remember. In 12th of January 1996, uh, much to my uh, despair almost at the time, Forte, having been so successful in 1994 in buying Meridian hotels, we had now moved to having 23 hotels in the region and we were really flying with new hotels all the time. Forte was taken over by, in a hostile bid by Granada. And uh, with all deference to Jerry Robinson and Charles Allen, great men, but uh, the takeover for me after 23 years with Forte Hotels really felt like a death in the family. It was very difficult to accept. And so I started to look around. And I happened to meet a gentleman who has worked for uh, Sheikh Mohammed uh, since 1971, since the creation of the state. So he invited me down to what's known as the ruler's office and uh, eventually asked if I would like to come on board to open the Jumeirah Beach Hotel, which was six months away from opening, and also to set up whatever would come, whatever would happen, and to do a strategy for the development of the company. So that's how we started Jumeirah in 1997, and what a journey we had then. And Jumeirah is something that I, I believe, yes, the hotels are luxurious, they are beautiful, we have the Burj Al Arab, we have all the lovely hotels, and I'll quickly take you through the timeline. But we had a great team of people in our corporate team, and we agreed that the fundamentals of our business, and I'm sure all of you agree with it in this room, the fundamentals are driven through the most junior staff, the most junior employees, who day in, day out, interact with the customers. We heard today how a comfy bed, yes, is taken for granted, but what makes the difference is a human interaction. So what we decided at the time was that we would set up what we call our hallmarks. And the hallmarks are very, very simple, very straightforward instructions, not only for the most junior employees, but for everybody, including myself, in the organization. And the first hallmark that uh, we've always had was that I will promise I will always smile and greet the guest before the guest greets me. And remember, we, had, we, we ended up with 11,000 employees uh, in Jumeirah, in Dubai. 
And we have so many people coming from the Philippines, coming from India, and sometimes they can be quite shy and a little bit deferential. We wanted them not to be arrogant, but to be very confident and very, very pleasant as they are naturally anyway. So we brought up our three hallmarks. Smile and greet the guest before the guest greets you. He said, our first response to a guest request will never be no. And to do that, it was very important, really, to empower junior people who are making decisions behind reception in these areas to be able to say, if somebody comes down in the morning and you get this awful question, did you have anything from your minibar? And you say, oh, yes, I, I think I'm... No, I didn't have anything. And they say, oh, well, we think you had a Coca-Cola. Well, hold on, I'm paying $1,000 to stay in your hotel for the night, and you're worried about a 45-cent Coca-Cola. And we don't empower the person behind reception to say, OK, don't worry about it, you'll have it on us. And I think more and more that's something that's so important within our business and was very much uh, behind what we were trying to do with our second hallmark. And extremely importantly, we had said that we would, for our third hallmark, we promised to treat everybody with respect and with integrity. Uh, even, to, even to today, there are still about 8,000 Jumeirah employees living on Jumeirah property in Dubai who are looked after 24-7 by the company. So to, to motivate this huge team of people and to keep them really on track, and so many of them have made huge sacrifices, very much like our forefathers made in having to immigrate from Ireland in the early part of the 20th century and right through, and you know, would often leave their families behind. And so many of these Filipinos, these Indian staff and Pakistani staff, staff from all over the world, leave, sometimes it's the mother who will leave their children with the, with the grandparents in the Philippines and will go to try to make a good life for themselves. So we owe a huge amount to these, uh, these employees and to these great staff who have worked for us. So in November 97, we opened the Jumeirah Beach Hotel, 619 sea-facing rooms. They said, you can't have a luxury hotel with that amount of bedrooms. But uh, I think we've proven them differently. And all thanks to this great man in the middle, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum. And this man is the inspiration behind Dubai, but the inspiration behind so many countless thousands of people who have had the opportunity to, to work in Dubai. Nothing is impossible for him. He works so hard himself, and as I said earlier, what he has done recently as Prime Minister of the entire Federation of the United Arab Emirates is truly amazing, as well as having 30% of his cabinet being female, local females, and don't worry, women can drive in Dubai, and uh, they can do whatever they want within their careers. In fact, the educational sector at third level is almost 60% female uh, within Dubai. But they really do such a, such a great job. He's recently introduced what's called a Ministry of Tolerance, which is a fantastic idea because it's getting across the message to everybody in Dubai, especially his own people, that look, you might have a lot of expatriates living here, like about 80% of the population, but you should be tolerant of all nationalities. We have our Christian churches, we have our Hindu temples, we have our Buddhist places, we have everything we need as far as living there, living in Dubai, and that's alongside the mosques and, and everything else that we have in that amazing city. Then in 1999, we opened the Wild Wadi Water Park, one of the most technologically advanced water parks anywhere in the world at the time, and still is today. But very interestingly as well, one of the uh, conditions we had in opening up this water park was the designers from the United States had said, part of it is in the operation, you must have, and they had calculated, 77 lifeguards throughout the water park. So we certified all our lifeguards, got them all in the Jeff Ellis uh, certification program out of the US. We became instructors ourselves and now use lifeguards throughout the beach area of Dubai and all the swimming pools. I think we employ, or Jumeirah now employs, something in the region of about 200 lifeguards. But uh, touch wood, as they say, we've had a very good record of safety with all of our water sports and our water park. When I was interviewed by this uh, famous Englishman who works with Sheikh Mohammed, and they were building the uh, Burj Al Arab at the time, this is before I, before I got the job, uh, this gentleman said to me, he said, well, Gerald, he said, how are you going to fill this hotel? 202 luxury suites, the smallest one is 1,750 square feet. How are you ever going to fill it? And I, his name is Michael. I said, Michael, you know what? I don't know. He said, well, that's the first honest answer I've got. He <laughs> said, of the people I've asked, how are you going to fill this hotel? But you know what? We did fill it, and uh, a lot of it is thanks to what happened in Dubai. And of course, as a hotelier, we get such wonderful opportunities to meet people like the great, the late Nelson Mandela, who came and stayed with us. 
and uh, well, you might like him or not like him. George Bush was uh, quite a, a well-known figure in the region also at the time, especially after, uh, after his, his work. Uh, which wasn't always that well, well looked, at, looked upon in uh, 2003 and the invasion of Iraq, whereas his father was very well regarded because of uh, what happened with the liberation of Kuwait in February of uh, 1991. And in running these hotels, again in setting it up, we said we have to punch above our weight. And I think this is something this country does so fantastically, really does punch above its weight. And this is a helicopter pad, as many of you may know, of the Burj Al Arab, <coughs> excuse me, right at the top. And here we have Andre Agassi and Roger Federer playing a game of tennis, compliments of the Dubai Duty Free, which in turn is run by Colin McLaughlin, a Galway man I'm sure many of you have often heard of. And this got on every single back page, sports page of every international newspaper worldwide. That, that year in uh, Flushing Meadow, the two gentlemen played in the final. And actually Rod Roger Federer spends a good part of his uh, life living in Dubai and is uh, playing this weekend, isn't he, in the, the Dubai uh, Tennis Championship. Another great stroke of good fortune, and how good fortune does help you as well uh, throughout one's career, was Rory McIlroy. Alistair Murray was our CFO at the time, uh, and Alistair was from uh, Hollywood as well in Northern Ireland, and he knew the McIlroy family. And Alistair would come to me a few years before we signed him, going all misty-eyed and saying about this great new amateur golfer coming up in Northern Ireland and we should really sponsor him. And then getting closer and closer, always coming back to me. And I said, for God's sake, Alistair, you're the CFO. If you want to spend money, you know, it's easy enough to convince a CEO. Why don't you talk to him? So Rory came out when he was 17 and uh, he played as an amateur in the Desert Classic in Dubai. And guess who's caddied for him? Alistair. So Alistair did the deal with himself and uh, Chubby Chandler and delivered a really happy five years with Rory that just such a huge, it made such a huge difference to Jamera in getting our name on the map. People used to always say, what's this Jamera, Jeremiah group? You know, it's not Jeremiah, it's Jamera, but they, Rory helped us a lot. And here is a luxury, luxury travel advisor, a big magazine in the United States. Here we are on the cover page. The thing I like about this very much, it says, Gerald Lawless, in brackets, right. So, well, like, you know, you wouldn't know <laughs> who's Gerald and who's Rory. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was so funny, but I'm afraid my handicap is still 28. And then just going in the timeline, in uh, 2000, I was told to go to a meeting, uh, a site meeting of the Emirates Towers. So I said to the same Michael, where's Emirates Towers? He said, just go and find out. So I go to the site meeting, as always, we have about 20 engineers around the table, and they say, what are you doing here? I said, well, I just listen and I'll tell you afterwards. So afterwards, I decided, well, Jumeirah was going to run this lovely complex that was put together of 400 corporate bedrooms and 50,000 square meters of, um, of office space in a connected tower. Actually, the uh, office tower at the time was the highest in Europe and the Middle East, and still is one of the tallest, apart from the Burj Khalifa, which is now the tallest in the world. Uh, but this was 350 metres high, whereas the Burj Al Arab was uh, 321. Another great success story of the Jumeirah Group has been the Emirates Academy of Hospitality Management, where I still remain, uh, having retired from Jumeirah, but I still remain as Chancellor and uh, Chairman of the Board of the Emirates Academy. And here we offer Bachelor's in Business Administration in Hospitality Management, and also a Master's Degree in uh, International Hospitality Management. And we've already graduated over 500 uh, students from the college, and they come from all over, about 60 different nationalities, but we're very proud that, they, that these students come in and look upon Dubai as a centre of excellence for education at third level in hospitality administration, uh, following only, of course, Shannon College of Hotel Management, the best hotel school in the world, as we know. Uh, we then went into management and we, we agreed to manage the uh, Carlton Tower uh, in London, which we took over in December 2001, just a few months after the, uh, the terrible atrocity of 9-11, which was quite challenging for an Arab group to come in and take over from Hyatt International, who had run the hotel for 20 years. Well, we did it, and uh, today it's still well-branded and well-known as the Jumeirah Hotel, along with his uh, smaller sister hotel, the Lowndes Hotel, uh, around the corner. So. We then worked towards building the last part of the beach area that we had available uh, in Dubai. 
And this pr property is part of Medina Jumeirah. Medina Jumeirah is made up of three components and each totaling almost 300 rooms. So we've now done the last part, which is called Al Nassim, which is just opened at the beginning of December. And this total resort has uh, finished up with 1,300 rooms. It's got about 50 restaurants and bars, and it's got 5,000 square meters of conference space. One of the most successful resorts, I would say, anywhere in the world, though it appears to be huge, is broken up into so many component parts uh, that really it does not feel so big. And again, we have a female, a lady general manager running the entire complex, a lady called Margaret Brown, who may be changing now to the Burj Al Arab. So Jumeirah around the world then started to move. We went from the US, where unfortunately uh, the Essex house was sold and Marriott did a better deal than Jumeirah to keep the management contract. But other than that, Jumeirah has now developed in many areas around the world with 23 hotels in 11 different destinations and also a very healthy international pipeline, again, of about, uh, of about 20 hotels running the Jumeirah Group and uh, a, a contemporary lifestyle uh, brand that will soon become uh, known in Saudi Arabia, starting called Venue, spelled V-E-N-U. But within our industry, I'm sure all of you would agree, sustainability is so important. And it has to be one of the benefits of tourism that we are actually benefiting the environment rather than in any way damaging the environment, especially, as was mentioned again this morning, looking after the very, the very product that we are promoting. In the Arabian Gulf, there are many uh, sea turtles. And sea turtles, they either get diseases or they actually get damaged by nets, by plastic, by propellers and boats. So over the years, working with the Dubai Rehabil Turtle Rehabilitation Group, we have actually rescued almost 800 uh, turtles from the sea. We take them into the seawater tanks of the Burj Al Arab and we bring them back to health. Sometimes they stitch on an artificial flipper on them. We then take them over to the seawater canals of the Medina Jumeirah. We have four kilometres of canals and we have an area penned off where the uh, turtles can convalesce and sometimes they lay eggs. And then about once or twice a year, and we normally do it around the World Economic Forum, which happens in Dubai every November for the Agenda Councils, uh, we do a turtle release into the sea. So we get the local school children to come, take a baby turtle and put it on the sand and watch it uh, scurrying down the water into the sea. So it's a great thing to do for it. And another very important area and benefit of travel and tourism has to be what we call cultural understanding. It's so distressing sometimes living in the Gulf, knowing how the, the, the lovely people we deal with day out, all the Gulf Arabs that are great, great people, totally tolerant, always welcoming of us expatriates to come and live amongst them where they say to you, you're one of us, you know. It, it is so nice. And yet so many people have so many prejudices about uh, their way of life and about their religion and everything. So Sheikh Mohammed set up the Sheikh Mohammed Centre for Cultural Understanding. And what we do, uh, what Jumeirah does, uh, once a week they take guests who want to go uh, on a Thursday down to one of the local mosques, actually called the Jumeirah Mosque, with nothing to do with our company, it's a residential area in Dubai. And there they get a lecture from an imam about not the differences in our religions, but actually the similarities. And they talk about Judaism, Christianity and Islam. Um, I think it's a great thing, you know, one thing that has to be from some people going on holiday. And we see the way demands of people going on vacation, is, the demands are changing all the time. People now want a sense of enrichment. They want to come out from a holiday feeling they're coming back better people than they went. So yes, enjoy your sun, enjoy your time, have good dinners, have your glass of wine and everything. But also to take some time to try to understand the culture gives our guests a, a great uh, feeling of that enrichment. So in Dubai, as you know, we have some great uh, homegrown bat brands. Emirates Airlines, which I'll talk about in a second, has really it's been the lifeblood of the hotel business in Dubai. And this is what I keep saying, open skies, open skies, open skies. You know, governments need to understand, no matter what happens with Brexit, with anything, open skies, that whole philosophy is benefiting every single person in our industry, but every single person who wants to travel. And as we heard from Niall this morning, we now have 1.2 billion people who took an international journey last year. And this would not stop, but we've got to be able to do it in a sustainable way. Now in Dubai, we now have 14.9 million tourists in 2016. Somebody's in big trouble because they didn't make the 15 million, so we were just short there, but we'll see what happens. The fourth most visited city in the world. 
750 plus hotels and 20%, at least 20% of Dubai's GDP is thanks to tourism. So we now have over 100,000 rooms. Dubai has been appointed as World Expo City for 2020 and the government wants 150,000 rooms. The government wants, Sheikh Mohammed has said, he wants 20 million visitors by 2020. And we're doing our damnedest, as I say, to get it because we are really pushing hard to get that number. And we have now seen quite a, a development in the whole product in Dubai, from three-star hotels to four-star hotels to our Burj Al Arab seven-star hotels. We've now developed uh, theme parks, which are becoming very popular. One opened recently, which is the same size as Euro Disney. And this all goes back to the self-belief. It goes back to ambition and it goes back to energy. The energy of a man like Sheikh Mohammed, who not only has the, the, the vision and the energy himself to be motivated, but motivates everybody around him and certainly motivates by example. This was Dubai International Airport when we came here in 1978. And this is Dubai International Airport today. Dubai International Airport you know, is now such an incredible place where it's been driven so much by Emirates Airlines. Emirates Airlines is now the most valuable, they reckon, in the world, at six, over $6 billion. It carried almost 53 million passengers as far back as 2015, and they have 250 wide-bodied aircraft and 250 on order. They are, as you know, the biggest operators. Probably the A380 might not be here today if it wasn't for Emirates Airlines who already have uh, over 100 in service and will go to 147 in total by the end of their order period. I once went to see uh, Sheikh Ahmed, the, uh, the, the chairman of Emirates Airlines, and he had a very nice uh, 777, very modern looking 777 uh, model in his office. So I asked him what, that's, what that was about. And he explained they had just taken delivery of their 100th 777, and that was the 1,000th 777 that had been manufactured by Boeing and they're still going to the next uh, 777X uh, generation now very shortly. So when we look at Emirates Airlines and we look at how they are the world's most valuable brand but yet at the same time Dubai has always kept an open skies philosophy, an open skies uh, regulation and they have allowed any other airline who passes the safety standards to fly to Dubai and hence they've been able to achieve so much. And we know within our business, as I was saying, the airlift anywhere has to be the, the lifeblood of tourism in a country, and especially an island country or, say, an isolated country. So, after 18 very active, great years, uh, Gerald finally said goodbye to Jumeirah, but not totally goodbye. They called it retirement Dubai style. Uh, I then went then to uh, Dubai Holding, which is the parent company, as Brian's explained, of the uh, Jumeirah Group, along with many other activities in Dubai. And I'm responsible for tourism and hospitality, more or less on, a, on an advisory role. But at the same time, I also uh, was elected to become chairman of the World Travel and Tourism Council. And if you can bear with me for a few minutes, I'll just give you some information uh, about the World Travel and Tourism Council. It's made up of the CEOs of the top 140 uh, travel tourism uh, hotel airline companies around the world. We have Arnie Sorensen, CEO of Marriott. We have uh, Richard Solomon, CEO of uh, Intercontinental. Chris Nassetta from Hilton. Willie Walsh of uh, IAG, which makes Aer Lingus uh, a member as well and uh, United Airlines. And we really are going from strength to strength, but we, are a pri we represent the private sector. We do not represent the government. And in the private sector, we say our pillars, our strategic pillars are very much about having freedom to travel, policies for growth of the industry, and sustainability. And really, freedom to travel is something that we, can, we, we must always keep talking about, and I will touch on in a couple of minutes. But again, we've heard from Niall this morning that now we account in our industry for almost 10% of global GDP, investment of $800 billion, 6% of export dollars. And we employ 284 million people worldwide. And this is quickly heading towards 300 million people. And we've got to get this message across to governments. And we spend a lot of time in WTTC talking to governments, making sure that we're really getting this message, which is so important. That we are an employer not only of great significance, eventually we reckon by 2025 it will be 1 in 10 or 10% 10 
of global employment, including the multiplying factor. But we also have to bring across the point to governments that actually we are the best employers of young people. Entry level jobs, great opportunities to get people work experience, to get people into an industry. And yes, some of them will leave. But we know now more and more with the kind of possibilities we have in careers for young people. I think the hospitality, travel and tourism industry is really one of the, one of the industries of the future. And we talk always within WTTC what we call freedom to travel. We're not saying that we just let everybody travel and we don't have any, you don't have any right as a country to worry about your security, to worry about the wrong people coming in. But we talk very much about why don't we have e-visas? Why do we have to still have paper visas? We shouldn't need them anymore nowadays. And very much, whether or not you give a visa to your country for a person, it's, it's not so much about the country that person comes from, it's very much about the suitability of that individual. We've seen the atrocities in France and in Europe generally, where all of this was, was carried out by people who were already citizens of these countries. So we can't say that uh, you're going to protect yourself by terrorism by just having bureaucracy around visas. And we've had great discussions, and uh, Niall is very much aware of it, over the years in, with governments, and we have lobbied very hard for what now happens with the, uh, the common travel arrangement, and particularly with China and India, where their one country's visa is recognised by another country. And why shouldn't it be? Why should we make it so difficult? Fifteen years ago, we said to His Highness Sheikh Mohammed, we said, look, we don't need to have this uh, concept of reciprocity. Why are you saying, for example, that if Europe doesn't give a, visa, make, give a visa waiver for the United Arab Emirates, then the United Arab Emirates will not give one to them? But so we want their business, so we should make it easy to buy. So why don't we just open up to countries that are not perceived as an immigration threat? And the great man that he is, he turned around and he gave it immediately to 29 different countries. And that's, we've seen how tourism has blossomed since. And governments do need to understand that we really have to ensure that we have a logical visa process, a logical visa system. And I'm really delighted that you have the common travel area. And I think the great point that keeps being made, it predates the European Union. It is very so much around, based around the fact that this was the agreement between uh, the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland. And it's something that we have to keep talking about. And I believe the Europeans have to deliver on, on our behalf as far as that's concerned, as well as the, uh, the British government. So let's hope it, it does continue. Also within the um, WTTC, we represent, in fact, uh, our CEO is the founder member of the Global Travel Association, which is a coalition made up of organisations, particularly and most importantly, of uh, the UNWTO, with whom we work very closely um, uh, on all aspects of travel and tourism. The Secretary General of the UNWTO, Caleb Riffa, is a great friend, and he is based in, uh, in Madrid, and again, works closely with the World Travel and Tourism Council to ensure that, uh, that we get as much voice as we can within the industry. So going back to the visa situation, we've been asking for ages about why don't we use technology? Why can't we develop all the technologies that we have? You know at the moment you check in at an airport, say I fly from Dublin to Dubai, they take a swipe of my passport. Believe it or not, that swipe is only shared with the airline. But there's no reason, like in countries like the UK, where you, they don't even share it with immigration. So immigration doesn't have anything to do with it. There's technology and software available that when that swipe is taken, then immediately, not only will the airline know you're checked in to give you your seat, immigration of the outgoing country would know you are leaving, immigration of the incoming country would know you are coming. Importantly, even the hotel can know when you've boarded the aircraft, so better not release the room tonight, guys. We need to keep it. But yet, we don't develop this technology to be able to facilitate travel for our international guests and make travel uh, a, a seamless experience for, for our guests. We also deal very importantly, as I said earlier, with sustainability. And here we work closely again with the UNWTO. I'm sure all of you are acutely aware of the Paris Climate Agreement. And this Paris Climate Agreement is really serious for us and it's going to continue to evolve and develop. We see uh, the, what they call the SDGs, because they, they have to have that, but they have now 17 
global goals for sustainability. And they say within travel and tourism that the main global goals that we are concerned with are number 8, 12 and 14, but I would say it's, it's all of them actually. And uh, if, you get, if you can read it, but like we talk about number 8 is good jobs and economic growth. Number 12 is responsible consumption. And number 14 is life below water. But in number one is no poverty. And I think that's something that our industry really does have to alleviate on a global basis. So we do stay very involved with our members. Uh, also, I represent the, what's called the Global Agenda Council for the Future of Mobility. Uh, I'm uh, a member of that council. It meets every, the, all the councils of the World Economic Forum meet every year in Dubai in November. And we work on setting the agenda for the uh, Davos Economic Forum. And I think that's also been a, a fantastic thing for our industry. We've, given, we've got a lot of concentration on travel and tourism and indeed meet within Davos in a special travel and tourism forum where now we're talking about we would like to develop what's called, you know in America where they have the global, uh, they have the Trusted Traveller Programme. We want to make this an international, global uh, Trusted Traveller Programme where if you're willing to give your data, we should have Schengen and we should have ESTA and maybe ASEAN and Australia and these countries who have very sophisticated visa systems combining their data. Voluntarily you can go into that and you become a global trusted traveller. You can then go where you like with your global trusted traveller card. It's something we're advocating through the World Economic Forum and certainly trying to support as well within the, uh, within the WTTC. And the WTTC you know, we are so happy to see what happened with Ireland, with Skelly Michael, with the Star Treks, with what you've done in terms of the, 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 uh, the development of the Irish tourism through the uh, film media and what a difference that uh, happens to make to Ireland in terms uh, of its uh, awareness on a worldwide level. We're also dealing a lot with uh, international uh, leaders. We have an open letter which we combine with the UNWTO and WTTC and we've so far got 84 uh, different leaders on a worldwide basis to sign up to their understanding of the importance of travel and tourism. And I was very pleased with what uh, Niall said earlier when he said that uh, you, you, you gave me the credit for saying that tourism drives peace because we were in Northern Ireland last year meet, uh, meeting with the First Minister, Howard was there, and um, with this programme is coming up and bubbling up is that uh, peace drives tourism. And I said, you know what? Tourism drives peace. And that is why I love working in this industry. It's why I believe so much in this industry. Because we can see, we can see very clearly, tourism is a force for good. It does good in the world, it brings people together, it abolishes prejudices, and very much tourism is a force for peace. Tourism drives peace, and tourism definitely drives prosperity. So ladies and gentlemen, thanks for bearing with me, and thank you for your attention.